sounds lonely, I think. My voice sounds lonely because these songs aren't meant to be sung alone. I think my voice sounds lonely because these songs aren't meant to be sung on a stage in front of an audience. And maybe these songs aren't meant to be sung anymore. When I think about why I just sang that song and why I'm here in front of you today, I have to think about why I moved to this country one year ago, why I peered out of thin air, one might say. Today I'd like to think through the echo of what I heard across the Atlantic one year ago, two years ago, when I first started reading about the oral tradition that I'll be talking about today. And I'd like to think through what that echo was and why it was so strong that it could have pulled me here and brought me even here in front of you today. When I thought about how to start my talk today, an image kept reoccurring, a description of a painting by Walter Benjamin called Angelus Novus. And I'd like to situate my talk today in the feel of this description of this painting. But because I'm talking about a pagan oral tradition, I'd like to turn the masculine angel into a feminine witch. So bear with me through Benjamin. Her face is turned toward the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, she sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of her feet. The witch would like to stay awaken the dead and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing in from paradise. It has got caught in her wings with such violence that the witch can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels her into the future to which her back is turned, while the pile of debris before her grows skyward. The storm is what we call progress. So my talk today is really situated in this description, in the feel of this position, in the field of vectors, of movement, of pulling and trying to stand still in this wind, this constant onslaught of progress. And I'm gonna to return to this figure and keep returning to her throughout this talk. In essence, what I'm trying to do here is resist the human-centered logics of development and progress that are so intrinsic to modernity. As Bio would put it, resist that kind of flatness and create some more creases here. By modernity, what I mean are the intertwined developments of individualism, capitalism, and urbanization, all supported by the idea of constant political and social progress. Also, national identity and nation states, especially in the Eastern European and Estonian context and how these are all sort of undergirded and supported by the creation and spread of the idea of a rational order, of the world being composed of fixed categories and people having fixed identities on that sort of grid of modernity. 
So by thinking through this oral tradition, this pagan oral tradition, and trying to do that alone on stage in this weird context, I'd sort of like to embrace the contradictions inherent in that figure of the witch trying to stand still, or me trying to do it alone here. And I'm interested in the way that those contradictions can be used as a kind of source of energy that starts to undo my grasp on the world, or our grasp on the world. I'd like to embrace the contradiction of trying to do this in the way that our bodies are oriented right now, with me lecturing to you. The root word of the word lecture, as Fred Moten taught me, is the elect. The lecturer, le uh, the lecturer reads to the elect, the elect few that get access to the lecture. I'm interested in resisting that logic as well. When I ask people about the, what this oral tradition means to them, I get some common answers. One of them is that it's a dead relic and there's no point singing it anymore. Another one, a very common one, is that this oral tradition is a nationalistic symbol that's been completely co-opted by the Estonian nation state and Eurozone values, etc. I see it a bit differently. I see that in this practice called Reiki Laul, there are a set of seeds or core ingredients, if you will, that I really think is important to amplify. When thinking about the conference theme of underground networks, then I see this pagan oral tradition called Reiki Laul as an oral, shadowy, marginal practice. It's also a way of maintaining a relationship to the non-human web. And finally, it's a way of resisting together through a kind of very strong and robust physical kind of sociality. And I think that's something we really need in this moment of ecological apocalypse. I'm interested in preserving those seeds, those ingredients against those common understandings of what Reiki Laul is. And really like the witch to get in the way of progress, get in the way of that modernist logic. And here I'm thinking about preservation also as revolution and celebration, that those things all come together. But what are those seeds? What are those capacities buried in the tradition of Reiki Laul? First of all, Reiki Laul is an oral tradition, which means that it's a way of passing down information, medicine, wisdom from generation to generation. It also means that these songs are learned by being in the same time and space with each other, of breathing the same hot air, feeling the friction of each other's presence over and over and over again. But I'm interested in another aspect of oral tradition, which is the, the idea that the notion of selfhood or the very feeling of having a self is actually very different in oral culture. If you think about, I don't remember when I first started reading, but if you think about when you first picked up a book, what starts to happen maybe is the formation of an interior voice for the first time that kind of cuts you out of the audiovisual matrix you've been living in up to that point. And this aspect of a kind of distributed self that is very part of this constant flow of information, this flux of, of feeling and sensation, this is something that's very important for me in Reiki Laul. It's also a communal practice. These songs are sung for the community, by the community, and in order to maintain those communal bonds. These songs don't belong to individuals. In that sense, I think Reiki Laul is a kind of alien practice. We're so used to thinking about music, musical performance, artistic, cultural production as an, an artist kind of working through this inner emotion, this interior experience, and then owning that product and giving it to people, kind of selling it. I think Reiki Laul is really alien to that way of thinking, and it's something we can't even really quite imagine. Reiki Laul is also a pagan tradition. It's really a way of not only creating, but also maintaining kinship with the natural world and those forces within that world sort of mediating and kind of coming from a place of need, it's important and necessary to actually mediate with that world. So a lot of the communicational partners, more than 50% of the people, the beings that you're singing to in Reiki Laul, are non-humans. They're trees, rivers, forests, and stones, for example. But I'm interested in the second idea of this non-human, and I'll unpack this later, but I don't think Reiki Laul actually came from humans. 
if we think about the figure of the modernist project, this rational intellectual individual subject, I don't think the people that this tradition came from really fit into that category. Reiki Laul is also ritualistic. It's, way, it's a way of singing what you see in order to cause a change. Again, this idea of need and urgency. You have to sing in order to heal someone. You have to sing in order to maintain your relationship to a wider ecology. In that sense, it's a form of group magic, winter solstice being a great example when the sun is at risk of disappearing and you have to make a lot of noise in order to prevent the dark spirits from taking the sun. In that way, Reiki Laul is also cyclical. There are different songs for different times of the year that have to be sung at those times. But when you actually sing Reiki Laul in practice, the kind of group breathing that is created with you following the lead singer, ending their words and taking over from each other, this kind of slightly call and response repetitive cycle, it is very cyclical. So you become part of a practical, physical, spontaneous cycle. And these songs often are very long and very non-linear in nature. Another aspect of cyclicality that is crucial for me is this idea of self-organization. The Girmas church celebration in southern Estonia and Setoma is a great example of this, where people know how to have a good time without a leader, without command and control, without a Google calendar. People know what their responsibilities and roles are in the community because they've been doing it their entire lives. And this way of living supports that kind of cyclical self-organization. So when we're thinking about this web of relationships and ingredients and seeds, I'd like to come back to the theme of underground networks. Being an oral tradition, the Reiki Laul really is untraceable. The traces that we have aren't very concrete and folklorists, researchers, myself included, have to do so much kind of speculation and almost creative speculation to think through what this practice might have meant. It also comes from the margins and periphery of Estonia. Historically, Seto and Kichno Island, where, these, um, where this practice was the most kind of maintained, are, were the most historically marginalized areas. Another sense of underground networks involves, you know, the mycelium and all this, this non-human web and very much, I think, as a pagan tradition, Reiki Laul is a way of maintaining this relationship to that. But in English, there's a third sense of underground networks which involves a kind of militancy or violence. And I'm particularly interested in this meaning of underground networks. For me, it connotes a group of people resisting a prevailing order, all up in arms about something, hiding out in the woods, for example. And Peter told me a great story about this Mordovian folk singer. And Peter, I think you saw him perform many times, and then he asked the singer about the aesthetics of his songs. And the singer said, aesthetics, this is warfare. So thinking about that third quality of underground networks is really the one that I'm sort of the most interested in. And Fred Moten taught me about the importance of connecting celebration and resistance, or celebration and critique, kind of getting caught up in something wider through these seeds and through these ingredients is really, really important to me. And I'm sort of interested in amplifying the seeds of resistance and celebration. What I'd now like to do is go back in time to look at the people that Reiki Laul came from, think about the conditions of their lives and what role Reiki Laul might have played in their lives. And really, I'm sort of tracing this history, and for me to trace this history is to trace the history of a radical practice of gathering and celebration, of being together in time like we are right now, breathing the same air, of staying connected to non-humans, and of bearing violence and pain together, collectively. Things that we desperately need in this ecological apocalypse where this kind of latent anxiety, trauma, fear is everywhere around us, but we don't really know what to do with it. What I'm sort of talking about or arguing for is the creation of a new old oral culture that can only exist maybe if we blacken the whitewashed neutral narratives of the Estonian nation state. 
So come, let us drop into the noise of Reke Laol, because that's what the colonizers thought it was. And like the witch, like Benjamin's witch, let's try to awaken the dead and make whole something that has been smashed. So the people living on this land before modernity, who exactly were they? First of all, they were serfs. They were living in the social condition of serfdom, which means they were tied to a piece of land. They were owned by a manor lord. They had no right to like own property or move around the country. And this social condition was passed down with birth. In that sense, they were objects. They were private property. And another way of thinking about that is that they were non-human. They were not subjects. They were not the figure of the modernity, this human individual that, you know, had access to the written word and logic and rationality. They didn't belong to those categories. When we think about a read, what the Baltic German colonizers are writing about Estonians when they were active on this land, they directly compare Estonians with indigenous people in North America and African slaves. Estonians were considered wild, savage people with no history and no signs of progress, culture, technological evolution. So in many ways, these quote-unquote Estonians were also non-white. If the modern subject of modernity is the white, human, masculine figure, it's sort of invented by the project of modernity, the people living on this land really did not belong to that category. So before I moved to Estonia last June, I heard a wonderful, wonderful conversation between Fred Moen and Stefano Harney that gave me access to a bunch of conceptual tools that have been extremely useful to me. I'd like to share one of those with you, but in the spirit of resistance in underground networks, I'd like to call it a conceptual weapon, because that's really how I see it. And this weapon is called the ontological totality. It's a term used by Cedric Robinson, whose book, Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition was published in 1983. And this book is a very long, very dense history of European civilization in which Robinson is kind of uncovering the way in which racism, this artificial categorization of people on this almost modernist grid of identity categories, that didn't start with the Atlantic slave trade, but was built into the very fabric of early European civilization, 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. An essential part of Robinson's study of racial capitalism is the idea of the ontological totality. An ontological totality refers to a way of being that emerged from the terms of Western domination and exploitation, the terms that were active in Estonia, working on these people. But it's a way of being that also escapes these terms and makes its own history. It's a kind of revolutionary collective consciousness that is elusive and resilient, hiding under your skin, behind a corner, always around us, imminent in that sense. And so for me, the echo that I hear in Reki Laul is the ontological totality. It's a trace of a worldview and a practice in which the natural world and humans were deeply intertwined through relations of kinship that had to be continually maintained. It's a way of being in which people were not separated artificially from each other via the conception of the individual or private property or from nature via the conception of the human with the capital H. These seeds that I outlined and tried to touch in this talk are a part of a way of living and a way of singing that actively preserved and transmitted this way of being, this ontological totality to the next generation. 
Crucially, however, for me is the political context and the political economy of this ontological totality in Estonian history. If we think about the nexus of forces here, Baltic German colonization, the thrust of the modern project and the move from a serfdom economy, which is sort of natural, involves agriculture, into a cash-based economy around the 1870s. This is really the entrance into capitalism and into the global world order that we're pretty much still dealing with to this day. This way of life that is that Reiki Laul kind of contains and activates is not only, I think, the result of a pre-modern way of life. You get this common dismissal, oh, they were just nature people, as a way to maybe get a lot of distance between us and them. I see this way of life as being a product of the social death and the condition of objecthood that Estonians were living under, but not only. They needed the ontological totality in order to bear the possessive violence that they were experiencing. They needed to gather and connect to non-humans in a ritualistic way in order to distribute pain and share joy collectively. And Reiki Laul in its communality and orality and orality, ear and mouth, was one of the primary ways that this was done. So if we trace the historical trajectory of Reiki Laul, then we can see how the tradition starts to fade the moment that these people are allowed to enter the front gates of modernity, with the creation of the nation state and the formation of the national Estonian identity. When Estonians are allowed to become individuals, they're quite literally given last names. They did not have last names before this point. And it's quite funny that there was a group of people living on this land that actually refuse to be given last names. And I very much identify with that group of people that was hiding in the woods. I think they had a suspicion, a sneaking suspicion, that to be given a last name is actually to lose touch with something really, really important. And of course you have the ability to purchase property uh, and all of those things as well. You have the spread of literacy by the translation of the Bible, and not only any Bible, but the Protestant Bible, which is a very specific flavor of individualism and individual work ethic. And then you have choir music, which basically repre- replaces Reiki Laul completely, which leads us to the Estonian Singing Festival and the creation of this national singing identity. So let's come back to the figure of the lonely witch, thinking about these vectors of progress and this high-speed train, almost. Think about this witch gazing toward the past, trying to resist those forces, trying to stand still in that storm. We're so used to thinking about development as a good thing, as progress, human rights, freedom. And I'm interested in standing here and sort of in the contradiction of saying that maybe those things aren't always good that that force of progress also steals from us, robs us of the capacity to gather and be in time and space with each other. That force of progress stops the transmission of intergenerational wisdom and healing and medicine and knowledge. This force of progress that lives not only in society and systems and institutions, but also in our own heads and those lonely, separated, literate voices. I'd like to get in the way of that progress, and this, way is a t- this talk is a way of doing it. But I'm weak and I can't do this alone. This talk is a way of asking for help of asking us to rethink the tools that we're using and the ways that we are working. I quite literally need help to work against the ways that we're oriented in space and time right now. And despite the promises of security and safety and individualistic career advancement, I think we could all agree that those things won't help us bear or process the hardcore loneliness of living out these final days as individuals on a dying planet. For the colonizers, Reiki Laul was considered noise, the wild cries of a wild people without history or culture. I want to drop into and protect this noise because it means dropping into and protecting the ontological totality, this way of being connected to each other and the world around us. 
I want to preserve this noise made by objects, by non-humans that did not and cannot fit into the modern world. They literally cannot be incorporated into modernity. I want to learn from the physical sociality of Reiki Laul and inject its violent power into the present moment in order to resist that loneliness of individualism and human exceptionalism. We need to renew and rethink the ways that we gather, with humans and non-humans especially now. It's a matter of life and death, or as the folk singer put it, it's a matter of warfare, not aesthetics. And for me, looking at the Reiki Laul is like looking at a recipe book for a communal feast that might turn into a militant underground celebration and then a soup kitchen on a corner and then a mosh pit under a bridge. We just need to be brave enough to take the risk of actually looking at this recipe, of looking sideways at the ingredients to avoid the ways in which this tradition is seen as being dead or just a symbol of nationalism. But we need to not only look, but actually feel out the ingredients of this tradition with our bodies in time and space together, cyclically and ritualistically, making something urgent and necessary. And this cannot be done alone. Thank you very much. Your talk was like a poem of Allen Ginsberg. Oh, wonderful. So beautiful. Wonderful. Uh, Are you open for questions Many, please. and comments? Please, please. Hello. I'm just wondering, are you familiar with the singing uh, part of capoeira from Brazil, which is uh, kind of similar uh, to Reggae Ah, uh, I have heard that they sing while they do it, but can you tell me more about how they, like how exactly do they sing in capoeira? I mean, it's similar to Reggae okay. but I just recently started this practice, so I don't think I can say okay, much sure. about it yet. Uh. That's really but good. Maybe yeah. it's interesting to explore because I guess the background is a little bit similar as well. Totally. Where it comes from. And capoeira was also, if I remember correctly, like it's it's is it a sort of African tradition or it's mixed in with the kind of colonization history of Brazil? Uh, yeah, I mean I don't know the very beginning of roots maybe from Africa, but uh, it started uh, in Brazil as a martial art combined with dancing and yeah. acrobatics yeah. Uh, among uh, dark-skinned slaves mm -hmm. to kind of uh, fight without fighting mm -hmm. and it's a non-contact mm -hmm. uh, martial art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good connection. So kind of a trick, tricking as well. <laughs> Especially thinking through resistance and uh, violence and a way to resist by being in contact with the body collectively. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to make your uh, MA degree in uh, Reggie Laul. Mm -hmm. And improvisation. Yes, and improvisation. Yeah. Um, how are you going to integrate warfare in this uh, making degree, this dissertation? Mm. That's a great question. I think warfare for me starts when you're in a, in a room with a group of people and you're actually given the, the time and the space to come into contact with each other. I really don't think personally that that's happening at all right now. Maybe there's two, three degrees of this. Um, if you think about the cyclicality and the kind of ritualistic aspect of singing Reki Laul or participating in oral tradition, you really have to spend a lot of time over and over and over again with the same people, and that's pretty uncomfortable, I think, for most of us. 
we don't really want to do that. Um, so for me, w warfare is really these spaces of community that are actually quite uncomfortable. And I think part of the problem these days is that we're not used to that discomfort at all. We don't know what to do with conflict when it shows up. We don't know how to handle it or get a grip on it. And I think that's also because we don't really have forms of mutual support either. It's not that we don't want to kind of have these group experiences that like fill us up from the outside and are kind of really intense. I think we sort of have like beneath, beneath like a kind of unconscious level, we want to have those experiences but we don't have the sources of support. Those sources of support have been taken from us. That's sort of what I'm arguing. We can't experience warfare because we don't have the support to experience that warfare, that erosion of the ego, that erosion of selfhood that this practice to me entails. So for me, part of the, part of the project and the, the research and the dissertation is how to physically create that source of support, support for people. And that has to come first. You can't just throw people into these like intense, like full body cyclical experiences that erode their very sense of self. You have to also like create those kinds of mutual uh, forms of support. And that takes a lot of time and it's slow and it doesn't sell tickets and it doesn't sell money and you can't really market it. Um, and I think that's great. I see. Uh, Please. Um, my question is, with whom are you singing Greggy Laul? And I think I'm asking this because until this moment I thought that Vaim Sarv is collective. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I am a collective of <laughs> fungi and bacteria. And <laughs> <sighs> no, at school I sing with Yannick Gauras. I sing with Lisanna Lanzalo. Uh, these are the main people. Uh, it's very hard, actually, to find people to sing this song with, for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, which is a shame. But I am an—I'm not an individual. But my name happens to be by himself. Of yes. Yeah. Please in the back there. And do you also collaborate with other researchers or practitioners of Reiki Laul in Estonia? And if yes, do you have uh, different perspectives than they do? Yeah, I definitely have different perspectives than they do. I think that has to do not only with maybe that I'm drawing from this kind of decolonized, like decolonial way of thinking, but also that I, I'm not fully Estonian or don't fully belong to this culture. Um, so I've definitely butted heads also with not only researchers, but people that are like, people in my family that are very, very like deeply um, part of this tradition and Setoma, this direct transmission of oral tradition. And I show up like kind of this very American attitude. I have no idea about Estonian cultural norms or anything and uh, definitely different perspectives. But and it's sort of an age thing. Um, this community in Setoma is much older, much more traditional. Here in the city and at school, it is possible to have these dialogues. I think Anna Hintz is another example of someone that um, in Estonia is really a, both a practitioner of Reiki Laul and very kind of open to these perspectives that are maybe a bit more queer, a bit more decolonial, a bit more contemporary. For me, it's crucial to, if we want to breathe life into this tradition, we have to really work with those perspectives as well. It can't just stay in this folkloristic or like this... I don't know, kind of Eurozone ethnographic research world because this is very limited, I think, and limiting. I also happen to have some neighbors who are practicing regular. It would be interesting to uh, listen to the Maybe both, we can both hang. of your uh, <laughs> perspectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One question in front here. Hi. Uh, so you described that the traditional regular had a large component of necessity yeah. in the sense that it is something that you do when something in the external world happens. 
but uh, what do you think about the uh, part of necessity in the modern trying to revive it? Do we also reinterpret the necessity part like something that we need, I don't know, internally, or, or we just discard the necessity altogether and make it just a joyful thing or... or yeah, that's yeah, that's a wonderful question. I think the, sort of the, the, the fake promise of modernity is that with this access and through the front gates you get access to comfort and everything, but that's always comes at the cost of this violence being displaced to someone else on the world or some other ecology on the world. So the sense that things aren't urgent anymore, they've always been urgent. And in a sense, we've always been in debt to the planet. And like urgency, it's just as urgent. It's just now for the first time with the climate crisis, we actually start that, that crisis that has always been going on is coming to our front door. But I think there's a deep sense of urgency and f like find like part of this kind of idea of blackening the nationalistic narrative is about thinking about what's actually urgent right now. We think that it's so comfortable, European values, et cetera, et cetera, but there's, like, I don't know, this country, there's a lot of anxiety and trauma in people's bodies that has nowhere to go. It's urgent to deal with that. It's urgent to come together to hold that collectively. And the problem is that we think we have to handle that alone. And that's violent. To, no one can deal with these. Trauma is never an individual thing. It's a communal thing, it's at the community level, it's at the national level, it's at the international level. So in that sense, I think it's extremely urgent. But joy and happiness are crucial parts, it's also celebration. And when those things actually start to happen at the same time, for me, part of this practice is also like the difference between negative and positive emotion starts to erode as well. Because there actually isn't a difference. These things are felt by the body as a whole. Modernity wants us to think that those things are separate experiences. That's a good question. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and this can be just the last question. Quite short one, please. Thank you, very shortly. Uh, this uh, Reiki Laul, the thought was that it was um, kind of part of life, yeah. so, uh, and part of working life, so anyways, it happened all the time and nowadays um, if it seems that if we want to really take it into our lives we have to give space to it yes. uh, so no music yeah. <laughs> and if I have headphones I I don't even think about singing with you because yeah. I always have that in my yeah, yeah, yeah. head yeah. 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 thank you yeah. Yeah. Oh. The question. there is one more uh, what's going to happen on Saturday Ah, uh, yes, please. If you want to uh, come, uh, I highly recommend. Annette Bern and I have uh, co-curated the Biotopia art program happening in, on a wasteland in Las Namegi. Tickets are available via Fienta. It's a uh, Saturday at 7. Uh, there will be Reki Laul, Yanni Goras is singing with some other very good folk singers. Um, I'll be performing this ritualistic kind of improvisation. And then Young Boy Dancing Group, an international dance collective, will be uh, performing as well. So site-specific performance, blending experimental and oral practices. Please come through. Thank you, Kelly.